Club finally uh, agreed to do a demonstration on Windows Chairs tonight. Uh, Chris Bender. Thanks, guys. Thought I'd start by taking a look at a Windsor chair and taking a look at another Windsor chair. Both of these are right from my kitchen table. They're big difference between them though, really big differences. If you look, this one, 200 years old. This one, I don't know, 20, 30 years old. And I thought I'd start by showing the difference and showing the, the way a traditional Windsor chair was made as opposed to one that was made in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And a couple of like big differences when you stand back and you look at them. First, you notice the seat. Here you've got a big fat seat. And here you've got a really thin seat. You have a seat that if you look, it puts sculpturally, it puts it together. If you look, you put, this, this holds the whole chair together. If you look, this looks like a little bitty flat thing that really sculpturally, sculpturally doesn't look like anything. It really doesn't. If you look, really this flat surface is, this is solid maple, but it really doesn't, and you think it's strong, and it, it just doesn't look right when you compare it to something like this. These chairs were always made of solid softwood. Usually white pine. If it's New England, it's white pine. If it's southern, it's uh, poplar. And, but they did use other this wood. Is almost always hickory. But you know, once if they didn't have hickory, they'd use ash, they'd use some other woods. The bottom is almost always soft maple. So this would be soft maple, or, you know, or they, again, they use what they have. But they tried to make it relatively light. This chair, soft maple, pine, and then hickory, you're using three different woods, you put it together and you make really a high tech chair. It's really high tech because the soft maple was light, but you could make a big and beautiful turnings as opposed to these that really don't look like much. They were often made to use as like garden furniture. So, you know, like you still use like dark green furniture. You picture that 1920s furniture being dark green. Well, the 1820s, well, this is like a 1790s chair. They did the same thing. Sometimes they were even painted white like garden furniture, but they were used inside. They were used all over, usually dark green. It's strong. This is one solid piece of wood. This is, these spindles, look how fine and thin they are. 200 years old, much stronger than these spindles that are much thicker, and I'll show you why in a little while. These, look how thick these are here. And this is, as these chairs go, these are, this is actually a pretty nice one. So often they're really fat, and these are often really fat and really ugly. Looking. One other major important thing. If you look, it's a flat surface. If you look on here, these have been drilled out, and the legs actually come through all the way. And I'll show you how that's so important later. And I'll show you one reason it's so important, is because every year in the winter, when the house dries up, every one of these, in fact, look at this one. I just took one from, see the way it's coming apart here? It comes apart every winter. I've got to clamp, put glue on it, clamp it up. These pop out over here every winter. It, it just really isn't a good design for a chair. 200 years ago, they had great design for a chair. And if you make it right today, it's still a good design for a chair. And he wrote a book on when making Windsor chairs. And I noticed it's in the library back there. And what I did was took, one of, took his method, and I followed it step by step by step. You call this a stackback Windsor. And the reason it's a stackback <laughs> is because the story goes, they used to take a potato sack and put it over there so, you had, so the wind didn't blow through it. But it looks like a sack back. It's got, what makes this special is it's got, yeah, it goes, it's got one bending that goes like this, one bending goes like this. It's held together with spindles in the back. This is a, they call this a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. They have five ones, they have nine ones. Um, you always have an odd number because you want one in the middle just to have it look right. But if you look, it's the same thing. The seat is a sculptural piece. It puts the whole thing together. It's carved out. It's never just a flat thing. Okay? So I thought I'd start by talking about the seat and how you make a seat. It's almost always two inches thick. Now, I used walnut. 
Traditionally, you use soft wood to make the chair nice and light. But traditionally, because I love antique tools, they'd use a turning saw like this. And you can still use these. And I don't know if you're used to seeing these saws, but you clamp this on the bench. And you turn, and this turns like a big coping saw. These handles turn, and you just go around and around. And if you've ever used one of these, if you had the bench here, you could do it. It's not that bad. Trick to using antique tools, sharpen them up. After, after you cut out the seat, you've got to carve out the seat. You've got to saddle it. And you make the seat, it should be saddled. This is a little poncil here that sticks up. So you actually, when you sit in the seat, it's not a flat thing. It actually goes up in the middle, and it's really made for you. Now this is a gutter adds, and you put it, I actually have some, this was a chair that a friend of mine was making, he gave me the blanks, he had it half made, and I told him I'd use it for a demonstration. Now I wish I saved it, because I could actually, I'd like to make one, and that, this wood's hard to get. But you take it and you put it between your feet like this, and you carve it out, yeah, it's, it's, to carve out something like this, they had a different ads that a bowl maker would use. This is a bowl maker's ads. This is an 18th century bowl maker's ads. Right with you. And you would go like this on a bowl and carve it out. And I think that would be a lot more, a lot better. To smooth it out after, after you've adged it out, there's a couple of traditional tools. Spoke shave like this. And the spoke safe is just flat, a traverser goes up. But this is a real chair maker's tool, and it would go like this. And you clean it up and smooth it out with a traverser like this. And it gets you a nice, fine, fine uh, finish. It really does. I use these. And these are like they're little spoke shaves. I took one of these and smoothed it out. I didn't sand it afterwards. I don't believe I sanded it. I just used this, and I love the finish that you get from just a uh, spoke shave. I don't know if you can see this, but you, I bet you can from back there. It's all these ripples in there. Can you see all the ripples? You, you can see because it's shiny. It's not supposed to be shiny. Somebody varnished the bottom of this. Don't ask me why. But you can see it's, and you can come up later, you can feel the tracks in there. That's the tracks from an early, early jack plane. And you'd have rough wood. Sometimes they'd actually split it out. But they probably uh, use like a big old sawmill to, to mill this out. And you use a jack plane. And this is a jack plane. And if you look, the bottom's rounded. And this, they'd use this first. Sometimes they could cross the grain too. But usually with the grain. And you just, just smooth it down just enough to make it flat. You get this little thing they call a rain gutter in there. Just for like decorations to separate the flat part to where it goes in. And I just did this with a chisel. Traditionally, they were always one piece of wood. If in the book, they talked about that, and they found one or two that they've glued up, old ones, and that's it. Almost always, they had one piece of wood. And if you want to make reproduction Windsors now, the hard part is finding wide, thick wood. It's just not out there. So let's take a look at the legs. This Windsor chair's legs and the, like, the modern reproduction legs is these legs are split out. And they split out the, we, you split out the legs in an old Windsor chair the way they were made because it's much stronger. It's also easier. If you don't have like these big power tools, you get a piece of wood, stump-like. Picture you need a piece about that thick. That, you split it. You put lines down. You take wedges and you split it out. You can make blanks. It's called riving the wood. You can make blanks very quickly, and they go with the grain, always with the grain. If you started with a board and you cut these legs out, which you're going to have when you cut the board in the sawmill, the, the grain goes in and out and in and out, and it's not nearly as strong. So because you've riven the wood and it, the grain goes exactly straight through there, you know that if you make these turnings really thin and strong, I mean thin and, or fat or whatever, you're going to have a strong piece of wood. You don't have to ever worry about it breaking. This is a fro. It's just like a, a thick piece, of, just a big wedge. And you hit it with a mallet. And for the thinner pieces, and especially the top pieces here that are also all riven out, you just put, the, put it on the wood, you hit it, and you split the wood, and then you turn the handle. And it's called a fro because you go to and fro. And you split down the wood. And works very nice. Works very nice. This top has to fit your reamer. Here's my reamer. 
Okay? So you make the leg any way you want, and you make the top just fit your reamer, like that. Okay? When I'm going to socket the leg into the chair, first you drill out the hole with a regular, relatively regular drill. Then you ream it out with the reamer so that it fits in and you get a really tight fit. And when you sit on it, it just tightens it up every single time you sit on it. Chair is held in tension. If you look, four legs go in like this. Each one's reamed and they go into the seat. Now to hold them in the seat, not only are they reamed and they fit tight, you can put a little glue. Plus, at the very top, you widen the hole, you ream the hole just slightly. Then you're going to split the wood at the top and put a wedge in there. So what happens is, if this is the chair, you split the top and you put a wedge in, it's not coming pulling down, and it's not, and it's reamed this way, it's stuck in there forever. You've riven the wood, so this wood is really strong. This, this chair is made to last 200 years, and probably if no one mistreats it, it lasts another two or 300 years. It's, it's really, it's a high-tech chair. This piece and this piece have to be made perfectly proper so that this has to be, wait, this has to be dry wood, this has to be wet wood. So when this goes in, it shrinks up. This one shrinks up around it and it tightens in there. You take the ends of the stretcher, you put it in hot sand for an hour, and it dries it really tight, and then you drill the hole so it just fits in there. You've got to get the angles right. And if you look, those are weird angles. And if you read Dunbar's book, you got this angle like this and this, and this angle like this, and I forget the number of degrees. But what I did, what he said to do, and what I did, was I took little anglers here, and I set this one at one, one, to one and one for, one for like the la lateral and one for the horizontal here, and I set these up like that, this one like this, for back and forth, and this one for right and left. And then I'd have to, I did it by eye, and I just drilled the hole. Let's take a look at the top. The top, again, is all held together. And if you look how thin these are, these are all whittled out. And you'd whittle these out. They're thicker in the middle for to please your eye, for the design. If you look at the design, it looks right like that. The hardest part of the whole chair is this and this. You split it out, then you whittle it. Then you've got to steam bend it. And the way I steam bend them, is I took stovepipe about this high, and then I put a, uh, I don't know, they, they come together, you get a, like a T piece, and I made it, it went out big enough to fit those, cap on each end, and it was open on the bottom. I put a pot on the bottom, a hot plate under there, filled the pot with water, steam comes up. And the other thing is did across, I put little bitty holes and put wires across it because you don't want the wood sitting on the, on the metal. It's got to be floating in the steam. You want it up in the steam. So I put it on, steamed it for about, because it was wet wood, about 20 minutes. If it was dry wood, you'd have to steam it for an hour or two. But this was wet wood, so I steamed it for 20 minutes. You put it on the form. I put one, there's one peg that goes here. Take it out of the steam. Got 45 seconds to bend it. You put one end here, you put in the wedge, you bend it across and put it down there, you wedge it again, you pull it down the rest of the way, you put the peg in and you have a wedge. And this goes on here. I steam bend this, this goes on, this is going to go on here. When I assemble it, this again is tapered and pegged on the bottom. This one's tapered and pegged on the bottom. Now each one of these, I glued them. But glue doesn't last forever. And this chair, I made this to last forever. So when I stuck these in here, I faceted the wood slightly bigger than the hole. So when I put it in, I hit it with a mallet, put it in, I hit it with the mallet, so the facets actually um, push it into the wood, and it drives it in, not enough to split it, but enough to really hold it in there. And it holds. When I finally go to put it together, 
you put it together without the holes on here. And you put all the spindles up, and you weave it in between the spindles. Because every Windsor chair is different. Every Windsor chair is just a little different. You have a knot over here, you move it over a little. And if you look at 100 Windsor chairs, every single one is going to be a little different. So to make sure you're lining it up right, I put one in the front, one in the back, one in the just temporarily. Oh. One in the front, one in the back, and to hold and I pushed it down there to hold it in there. And then I drilled, I marked it and drilled the holes right on there. So each one actually has a little stop on it. You'll never see it with your eye, but there's a little stop. So you push it down, you push it down, and push it down until you get perfect on your stop. And there you go. It's on there. You do for the bow on the top, you do the same thing. You put it on, you weave it on. These are a little bigger. I cut them off, but they're a little bigger. You weave it on there. You push this in. Then I, I uh, draw a knife this down a little. I saw right on here where it's going to go. And I drilled this again with my spoon bit. I had a little spoon bit. Pushed it in. Drilled each one of these holes with my spoon bit and my C-clamp, because I didn't trust it. And I pushed it in, and it fit just perfect. But I wasn't done. I wasn't done. Because each one of these now gets opened up. You have to open the hole just slightly a little bit at the top, cut them off, wedge each one at the top. So each one of these little spindles at the top has a little wedge in it, there's a little wedge here, there's a little wedge here, there's a little wedge here, holding this whole thing together. So it's never coming off. Last thing you gotta do is paint this thing. They were always, always, always painted because you had different woods, and really the art design to this is the silhouette that you get. Okay, you get this beautiful, beautiful silhouette from one whole color. Well, milk paint is weird stuff. And what you do is it's a there's casein in there from the milk. You got the color in there, and you got lime in there. And you mix it up, and you get a chemical reaction. When, once it goes on, you're not stripping this off. It's almost it's like putting cement on your on your wood. You're not taking it off, so you don't make any mistakes. Okay, or really, it's like putting cement on your wood. That's <laughs> okay. come on up, and you can check this stuff out. <laughs>